Good evening everyone, time for another member update. Now I want to take a look at this kind of strange story that has come out recently, highlighted at Zero Hedge a month ago and then more recently. And I've actually chosen an article from the Chicago Tribune just to try to get a neutral source on this. This is about the bond buying that's coming out of Belgium. Foreign demand for U.S. Treasuries falls, but Belgium's strong buyer. And this is May 15th, Reuters. Foreign capital inflow into U.S. Treasuries declined sharply in March, with robust demand coming mainly from Belgium, which extended its recent run of heavy buying of U.S. debt. Holding of U.S. Treasuries in Belgium rose a net $40 billion in the month over the last five months, Belgium's net increase totaled about $201.1 billion. The Eurozone nation is now the third largest holder of U.S. Treasuries, with $381 billion after China and Japan. The purchases from Belgium were mainly in short-term bills from November to March, but over the same period, Belgium institutions sold $6.82 billion in long-term U.S. Treasury notes and bonds, the data showed. Who is behind the large purchases from Belgium is unclear. Euroclear, a major clearinghouse in Europe, is based in Belgium and provides cross-border settlement and custodial facilities. Clearinghouses hold collateral such as treasuries. Meanwhile, the largest seller of U.S. Treasury securities was Russia at $25.8 billion, mainly in bills. Russian selling of U.S. bonds and notes totaled just $141 million. Overall, U.S. Treasuries posted net inflows of $25.9 billion in March, slumping from $92.5 billion in February, etc. So we've already talked a little bit about this. I think if you add up the numbers, if you divide this number here of the bonds that... Belgium holds, and you can see the majority has come in the last five months, it comes to approximately $100,000 for every man, woman, and child in Belgium, which has a population of about 11 million people. So the big question is, who is really behind this? Is it the Federal Reserve that's buying these bonds through an intermediary in Belgium, or is it the Belgian government doing the wishes of the Federal Reserve why Belgium? Well, I tried to do some research on this. There really isn't a lot out there, but there are some very interesting things that are happening and it kind of leads way down the rabbit hole. So that's why this is going to be a member update. The first story that jumps at us is Barack Obama's first visit to Brussels to cost Belgium more than 10 million euro. Obama will arrive with a 900 strong entourage including 45 vehicles and three planes and attend the EU and NATO summits. So that's the first thing about Belgium, very interesting, is it is the head of the EU and of NATO and we're going to look at part of the speech that Obama gave there but this is very interesting. As Belgium's capital and host to the EU and NATO, Brussels is used to deploy heavy security, is used to deploying heavy security when big names pop up, but US President Barack Obama's visit on Tuesday will strain the city like never before. The president will arrive on Tuesday night with a 900 strong entourage, including 45 vehicles and three cargo planes. Advanced security teams orchestrating every last detail have combed Brussels already, checking the sewers and major hospitals. Someone sounds a little paranoid here. Belgium itself mobilizing 350 police and military on motorbikes to secure the president's route. And uh, he's going there for a lunchtime summit with the European Council. So very interesting Brussels, Belgium. Now, the next story here is Chinese president arrives in Brussels for state visit, and that's five days later. The Chinese president Xi Jinping and his wife 
Pangling Yuan are welcomed by Belgian Prime Minister Ilio Di Rupo at the airport in Brussels, March 30th. And again, this was his first official visit to Belgium. So we have the President of the United States' first official visit to Belgium. We have the Chinese President's first official visit to Belgium. And we have this mysterious bond buying coming out of Belgium. Now, this is the remarks made. This is actually the from whitehouse.gov. This is the text of the speech that Obama gave in Brussels. A lot of this is saber rattling against Russia and what has happened in Crimea and the Ukraine. And Obama is citing a shared legacy that we have with the Europeans and let me read this paragraph here. In the end, the success of our ideals comes down to us, including the example of our own lives, our own societies. We know that there will always be intolerance, but instead of fearing the immigrant, we can welcome him. We can insist on policies that benefit the many, not just the few, that an age of globalization and dizzying change opens the door of opportunity to the marginalized and not just the privileged few. Instead of targeting our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, we can use our laws to protect their rights. Instead of defining ourselves in opposition to others, we can affirm the aspirations that we hold in common. That's what will make America strong. That's what will make Europe strong. That's what makes us who we are. So that's the rhetoric, and you can read this whole thing yourself. It's mostly a bunch of blather. But digging deeper into Belgium, there's some very interesting things that come out. Now I'm going to start with this castle. This is called the Mothers of Darkness Castle. And uh, there's speculation about Madeleine McCann. This was a big, if you haven't followed what's gone on in Europe with the kidnappings and child sex rings and all that stuff. I can't fill you in on all this here. But this castle here was mentioned by Fritz Springmeier in his Bloodlines of the Illuminati. And here's a little bit from the author. I guess I have an obsession with this castle. It appears that the owner does everything that they can to keep it invisible. Almost every image of it has been removed from the internet. As soon as a good video appears about it on YouTube, it is taken down. The images here have been rescued from Google's cache. The view of the castle on Google Maps is interesting. It appears as a nondescript blue blob. I've discovered through research that the castle is owned by Solve, the people who provide us with the controversial antidepressant, for example, Prozac and paroxetine drugs which have been held responsible for the spurge of mass killings being witnessed in schools and universities around the world. Solvay also provides children's camps across the globe and interestingly in Brussels. Would you trust these people to look after your child? Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the Detroit affair, but this was a massive controversy in Belgium. Uh, there was a pedophile network that came to light, was hushed up, and 20 key witnesses, actually there's a much larger number of witnesses, high as 40, committed suicide or died mysterious deaths, many of them on the way to testify. It's alleged that very key high-level government, government employees and judges and police officers and politicians were involved. In Belgium, the X-Files refers not to the U.S. television series, but a series of horrific, horrific witness accounts of an alleged pedophile network. The five women and male transvestite who testified anonymously in Belgium under the codename X described an underworld of snuff movies and sadomasochistic torture that was almost impossible to believe, and they said that politicians and other highly and it, and it goes on. And, and he goes into uh, Fritz Springmeier's 
bloodlines of the Illuminati and uh, this scandal. Now, remember that Belgium is the headquarters of NATO. It's the headquarters of the EU. Yes, this is also the headquarters of Satanism. Can someone check what Icky said? So this is a, apparently a very nasty place. And uh, let me show you some examples of this. Now, this is the White March. This is a very famous occurrence in the history of Belgium. The White March was a demonstration in Brussels on October 20th, 1996, after a serial killer and criminal, Marc Dutroux, was arrested. The demonstrators wanted better protection for children and a better functioning justice system that could investigate the Dutroux affair independently. So these people were marching against the corruption in their government and how their government had been basically taken over by these pedophiles. After Mark Dutro was arrested on August 13, 1996, and the kidnapped girls Sabine Dardin and Leticia Del Hess were freed from his basement on August 15th, commotion started. In subsequent days, the dead bodies of four other kidnapped girls were found buried in various properties that Dutro had owned. At first, the anger amongst the Belgian people was mainly directed at Dutroux himself, but it quickly targeted the police, the Justice Department, and the politicians as well. Many Belgians denounced the police and government for botching the investigation. If you watched any videos, which I've watched a number of them, this was not a botched investigation. This was an intentionally misled and failed investigation into the earlier kidnappings and failing to arrest Dutroux earlier, allowing to kill off the first four victims. A week prior to the White March, people had already begun gathering in the front of several courtrooms in Belgium. The mistrust of the police, Justice Department, and politicians increased when the investigating magistrate, Jean-Marc Conrette, who had been collecting evidence against the trope, was accused of bias and dismissed from the case. On October 14th, people entered the streets carrying flags, which said, I am ashamed to be a Belgian. On October 20th, 300,000 people, estimates range from 275,000 to 325,000, around 3% of Belgium's population, marched through Brussels. Many Belgians who lived outside Brussels came to the city to take part in the march. The demonstration called the White March was the largest one Brussels had ever seen. Everyone was carrying something white, a balloon, a cloak, etc. Some had their faces painted white. White was meant symbolically as the color of hope, etc. So this was a very important occurrence in Belgium. The Belgian people did not trust their government to investigate this thing, and we know the results of it. Everything was covered up, just like any of the investigations in the rest of Europe or in the United States into these sorts of things, whether it's the Franklin cover-up, the uh, McMartin case, any of these investigations into these child sex pedophile rings are always hushed up. And what that indicates is that these connections of these go to the very top. Now, let's look at some information here about Belgium. It looks like oh, this is a pop-up here. I'm sorry. This is... Well, I lost that article. Um, it was an article about, let me try to reopen my closed tabs. This was an article about a history of sexual violence in the world. Yeah, I don't have it. Anyway, it lists the rape capitals of the world. Belgium is in the top five. And there are other countries that are related to Belgium. Let's look at this article here. This is sexual violence in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but the Democratic Republic of Congo is formerly known as the Belgian Congo. This is formerly a Belgian colony. The Democratic Republic of Congo and east of the country in particular has been described as 
the rape capital of the world and the prevalence and intensity of all forms of sexual violence has been described as the worst in the world. Now, the article I didn't have in the window that closed, Belgium is known as the rape capital of Europe. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but back a number of years ago, there was the disappearance of Natalie Holloway Natalie Holloway disappeared on May 30th, 2005, while on a high school graduation trip to Aruba. Now, it later turned out that she was raped and killed by this gentleman, Joran Vandersloot, who is a Belgian. And Aruba, if you go and look into it, you'll find that it is one of the four constituent countries that form the Kingdom of the Netherlands, which is Belgium, or they're all connected together there if you look into the history. So what is going on? Well, there's something very, very dark in Belgium, and uh, I, I can't even imagine what it is. Uh, it, it's uh, very, very deep and very, very dark, but it's very, very disturbing to see the president of the United States, the president of China, going to the capital of the EU, the capital of NATO, and then having this place being the primary owner. If this pace continues, they will be the largest owner of US treasuries. Very, very disturbing stuff. Now, what is going on in Belgium as far as the future of Belgium? Well, I think this video is going to probably tell you. Here's the future of Belgium. Well, a Muslim party in Belgium says it's preparing to campaign for setting up an Islamic state there. Two candidates from the newly established Islam party won seats in a recent municipal election. Let's discuss this now with Philip Klaas, a Belgian Euro MP. Thank you so much, Mr. Klaas, for joining RT. Now, the party plans to Hi. run in Belgium's national election in two years' time. What do you make of their achievements thus far? Well, of course, it's very worrying to see what's happening now. We see people from uh, with an Islamic background uh, forming their own political parties now and demanding, you know, the introduction of Sharia law and an Islamic state in Belgium. Um, we've always predicted this, uh, but up till now, um, Muslim people uh, mainly supported uh, socialist parties and other leftist parties, but now they feel apparently confident enough uh, to make uh, their own party and to make their own revendications. So did you hear that? Uh, that's something similar that you're seeing in the rest of Europe now in the United States. They initially are allied with the leftists, but then once they feel strong enough, then they come out and talk about what they're really about. And uh, this is uh, something really worrying, I think. Now, you know, many Belgium cities, including Brussels, have neighborhoods with mainly Muslim populations. Uh, don't you think it's yes. only natural for those people to want their representatives to be in power? Well, um, first of all, the, the people who come into our country, and I'm not talking about just Belgium, but any other country in the European Union, um, people coming into the EU should adapt to a set of values, I think, uh, should uh, respect the separation of the church and the state, should uh, be in favor of uh, equality of men and women, uh, in, in, in favor of the rule of law, freedom of expression. And uh, uh, pedophile politicians. Uh, and when we see that people don't, don't accept this and um, are going to be candidates in elections, well, that, that I think that's a, there's a big uh, problem. And there's also a big problem with the fact that people who don't even have our nationality are allowed to vote for local elections in Belgium. And I think this should change. And first of all, also, we should uh, put a stop to this mass immigration of people coming from outside Europe and from mainly Islamic countries, people who cannot and will not adapt to our way of living in Western Europe. Uh, Mr. Klaus, might we see a rise in anti-Muslim sentiment and hate crime, not only in Belgium, uh, as well as elsewhere in Europe? 
Well, it's only natural, I think, that many people are worried by the current, um, you know, evolution, um, and people are worried if they see, uh, uh, you know, elected people in Brussels now. Uh, but it will undoubtedly come in other uh, uh, local um, places as well um, when these people, you know, openly call for the settling of uh, the settlement of an Islamic state. You know, we are in uh, Western Europe and many people don't feel at home in a city where such people are winning elections. And you could say, okay, it's only one seat in two different communes in Brussels, but I'm sure this is only uh, the start of something that will only um, gain in importance. And now very briefly, a separatist candidate was elected the mayor of Antwerp in an election earlier this month. Many see it as a step towards the independence of the Dutch-speaking region of Flanders. How likely is that, do you think? Well, F Flemish public opinion is uh, getting, you know, fed up with the current situation in Belgium, where we see that it has become completely impossible to agree on any major political issue between Flemings and Walloons. Uh, the actual federal government doesn't even have a majority on the Flemish side in the Flemish parliament. And this uh, Belgian government doesn't have any democratic legitimacy in Flanders. Um, we make up the majority of the population in Belgium, but we are not even uh, democratically represented within this um, federal government because this government is dominated by the French speaking King, a socialist party, and Flanders voted for completely something completely different. All right, thoughts and analysis from Belgian Euro MP Philip Klaas, live from Brussels. Thank you. Okay, so there you go. That is the future of Belgium. Now, there's other videos on that, and if you look at the trends, the population trends, it's clear that Belgium is probably going to be one of the first, if not the first, nation in Europe that becomes majority population is long. So the question is, what does all this mean? I can't answer that question, but I can tell you that it appears that Belgium is a completely corrupt nation and the politicians of Belgium apparently are completely compromised in these child sex pedophile rings and uh, my gut instinct is that uh, they're just going to be wiped out. Now, people would say, well, that's because they've been betrayed by their politicians and they're uh, allowing this foreign invasion to occur. Or maybe it's possible that that's just the judgment that comes on these nations that turn their back on God and uh, turn towards satanism and pedophilia that uh, from god's opinion maybe that these islamic nations should come in and take them over and we'll talk to you next time